sincere treatment of her dysfunctional family and other personal and political themes. I'll try to illustrate some of these in my talk. Born in Baranovici in 1989, she's currently engaged in literary postgraduate work in London. Bilingual in Belarusian and Russian with impeccable English. Koma draws on a broad lexical palette that includes occasional dialectal and obsolete words, although unflinching clarity of expression is one of her greatest strengths. The works on which this talk will be based are Strach Vishrini, Triputnik, which is forthcoming, Recycled, Muy Viernesa, as well as a book of translations of the verse of Charles Bukowski. Koma's first book was mistakenly thought by some to be childish on account of its mention of real or imaginary fears. In fact, however, it's a remarkably bold and mature statement of the poet's beliefs and views on many aspects of life. As an example of her poems about death, a rather strange place to start perhaps, I should like to take the extreme form of suicide with her response to the American poet Anne Sexton in At Kas na Vierge en Sexton, Jadani Pamerci, in which she follows Yalkenia Janiszic, who in 1983 had also written a poem to the American. In Koma's poem, she expresses sympathy but feels that she herself has not enough courage to follow this example, comparing the death wish to a war. Unlike you, N, Yanni Sparajala Samahubstvo, Ali Incest Samahubstvo Naradzil Mnie. Sposob pytania ad no raznastajnes si gusto. In the grim phrase, incest of suicide, it seems rather obscure, but most of what the poet writes about her parent is excruciating in its direct instance, in Yam Malchala, when she describes her father's drunken antics, Yam Malchala, kali tibie pukidali piana her saltobisa. O mnya bala lyalka, ya klapatila praeja, i pritiskala, da krudje svojih mocna. Ti, vsja tak padimausa, i mi ruhalis dalje. Escape from many things, including the cruelty of her father, forms the subject of Abmirjavanaya Kamyakom Mane, in which, pleading for release, she depicts him as being split like a hangman's rope, with one tooth left and just the body. This desperate image is the more powerful for its simplicity. Another example of referential writing is Idiotka, where she at first called herself Josephine, an idiot of Danish filmmaker Lars von Trier, but towards the end turns to her father again, as well as resuming her own name. The poem is a very personal outpouring, of which these are the closing lines. Mnie zavut Josefina, a heta moj batska, jon maj mježi, jon maj kajdani, jon maj vjaredi, jon maj turma, jon maj strahi, jon maj pasrednes, jon maj štučnes, maj neisnovanje. Mnie zavut Hana, ja idiotka. The fickleness of men is the subject of another poem, Mai Muschinen, 
which is mainly about parting from men and the ensuing results. As so often with this poem, a vivid image remains in the reader's mind. Here is the last stanza. Ya nikoli ni budu naljezit my muschinen. I kahanje hete takaja kulje, što vrivajce s hilzi i zastraje miš vrebro. Tam je je i pakinu, jak suvenir na pajmec. Clearly parting from lovers must leave the poet with a feeling of loneliness. Volker Hapieva has made this condition central to her poetic world about which I've spoken at this conference and written, indeed, uh, previously. Koma is familiar with some of the older poets' earlier work, but she brings her own bearing on the th this theme in a poem, Samorta Viechnha Padarozhnikam. Nistieshki Nistiaka Samorta at Mora da Mora. Fragmente ends with an indirect comparison between the abolition of loneliness and that of AIDS, describing the former as another kind of virus to be fought. Iti budish vedish, navat mi puzzle a quilt. Upamets pratih da hoja zarazila virusom vjeri u toje što ad noći bolje ni stanje samote. Locked doors have a considerable literary pedigree. For example, Komar's chosen poet for translation, Charles Bukowski's Hell is a Closed Door, is deservedly well known. And a promising Belarusian writer, Vital Rushko, called his debut collection, Dzwiery Zamknioni na Kriuchi. Her own poem, Zacinina, expresses frustration and the eventual realization of futility. Zacinina znutri. Zacinina znutri. Začinu na znutri. Možeš hlukat se hramči. Možeš lamat se dveri. Možeš da svitanka ustajac pod aknom. Ali je? Začinu na znutri i tam nikoha. Although not a comic poet, Koma shows a good sense of humor in her work. Two poems, as an example, take as their title Soviet cliches, of which the first, favored by the so-called Soviet Peace Committee, Miru Mir, begins by saying that the war ended in victory for both sides, as it was not a matter for women, however manly, or poets. At the end of the verse, it is revealed that language has been victorious. Ja pokladu tebe u zaplečnik sa bojkos move, naši ahulni move, akaja perimahla. The second poem, which takes an approximate but frequently quoted statistic referring to Belarus's losses in World War II, after a variety of other things, the poem ends with a cart stuck in what she calls the mud of everybody's favorite myth. It's worth quoting the beginning as an illustration of the poet's ironical response to the use of the war to prop up the present dire regime. Yakoshni Niznajomi minak. Kožne četvrti problema u jakoj ti vinovati. Kožne četvrti žitjo, jako je pražil ni tak. Kožne četvrti bomž, bez meti, bez praci, bez hati. 
кожні четверці кат і крати. Ти кожна четверця книга, та яку я не доспіла, кожна четверця справжня мара і витинатний план, кожна четверця десерт, який я не даєла, кожна четверця бездомна собака, якого я подобрала. Кожне четверце з невечене тіло і джало. In the poems I've mentioned, there have been passing references to hangmen, prison bars, and mutilated bodies, and several poems concern the political demonstrations on the streets of Belarus and the ensuing violent repressions of 2020-2021. Towards the end of these verses, however, is a striking poem about a German, Kurt Prüfer, who made a profitable living from the human ash in concentration camps, from Dachau to the Machilio ghetto. It's called Hetter Nia Siju na Balkoni Vosentvi Before turning from such uh, fascist atrocities to the violence in contemporary Belarus, it's worth remembering that only a year after his election, Lukashenko notoriously praised the work of Adolf Hitler in a German newspaper, doubtless seeing a model for his own style of undemocratic leadership. One particularly memorable poem, Nochna Auta de Zwonia, describes how a friend of Hannah Komer was beaten up and then incarcerated in the notorious Akrescina prison in Minsk, which is ostensibly a pre-trial detention center, but is in fact well known for torture and other abuses. kuli, <laughs> Сто тридцяти, сто тридцять п'яші, протяжні. Та ранку тваром у бетон. Непритомність, з якої вириває новий удар. Троє суток я з'їжджу. Нема отказу на всі наші білі кветки, червоні серця. Человечие тело и память вытремливают травмы, несумешальные с верой улевшие, переоменевые колоры, страх, тревогу, жалобу на супротив, чакание, надею. Когда все это закончится, я допомогу я допомогу тебе фарбовать эти голые стены у белой, червоной, белой. The following poem will illustrate the tone of the political neobarone cycle. У нашей камеры. Clearly reflecting not only the poet's feelings for her own experience, In the middle of the verse, there is a short dreamlike mention of normality before the reality of prison returns. У нашій камері на чотирьох все агульне, ватке, біле, літке, вохрове світло, рипіння, ложка. Холод скручений абаранком. Чистые поветки со щинами у окне. Солнце за хустым шклом. Хрупкот вольных техников. Браска тварей. Не перестукивание простены. Теплая вода в душу. Безодорант. Газета с конвордом. Холос, який читает. Скучений час, просьби, проклянні, кошмари, 
и одно на оси, когда выйду на волю. The lion's share of translations in the Bukowski collection are by Comer, and the rest by Yulia Timofeeva, wife of what the American poet might have ironically called a celebrity, Alvir Bakharevich. There's no time or point in discussing translations, despite Sir Comer's great skill in this area. To conclude, Hannah Comer, with her remarkably strong and varied poems, has made a remarkable start in what promises to be a stellar career. Thank you. Oh, yes. No, you're very welcome to it. Uh, thank you very much, Arnold. I think it's stuck. Oh, okay. Can you get it out and, without? Uh, like yesterday, we will be um, doing all the papers first, and then taking questions um, for from all the presenters yeah. at the end. Uh, so uh, we'll now move to our next presenter. Um, Rashid Chaudhary is an assistant professor at the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Manisa Jalal Bayar University in Manisa, Turkey. He received a PhD in history at Magjil University in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, and is a citizen of both Belarus and Canada. His research interests include Ottoman history, the history of Russia's involvement in the Indian Ocean world during the imperial era, and modern day Belarusian politics. His publications include a journal article entitled Identity Formation Among the Belarusian Tatars in the Context of Belarus's Transition to Independence, 1991 to 1992, published in the Review du Centre Européen d'Etudes Slaves. And Rashid's title today is Modern Day Belarus in Shamsedin Sami's Kamusul Alam. Thank you. You're welcome. welcome. All right. Uh, well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, and thank you for your patience as I was making my way here, uh, sort of bypassing uh, the central line, about half of which is unexpectedly, to me at least, uh, closed. Uh, today. So, uh, first of all, just a little show of hands, and I think I know what the answer will be in advance, but I could end up getting surprised. Uh, how many of you speak Turkish at all, know any Turkish at all? Uh, as I expected, it's none, uh, which is why um, I will quote um, directly in Turkish uh, from the Kamus uh, Alam very briefly, just to give you a flavor for what the language sounded like, approximately one sentence. And as for the rest, I'll be uh, sort of translating it into English uh, as I uh, go. Uh, so um, how do I actually move it from slide to slide? Because I'm pushing down and sideways. Uh, all right. All right. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Thank you. Uh, OK, uh, so this is what the book uh, Kamusul Alam actually looks like. It's a, Six volume encyclopedia, and it is uh, the first uh, encyclopedia published in Ottoman Turkish uh, in the Ottoman Empire uh, during uh, the time period that, uh, that's uh, shown uh, on the slide. Uh, obviously, uh, prior to Mustafa Kemal Atatürk's reform, uh, Turkish had been written for many centuries using the Arabic script. Uh, and so uh, the, the actual, the original uh, name of our title of the uh, compendium of the encyclopedia uh, is, is given above the transliteration into modern uh, Turkish script. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely uh, sort of um, artifact, the book itself. This particular cover I photographed just the other day at the British Library at the University of London. Uh, but uh, it's not, this wasn't my first encounter uh, with, with the actual printed uh, text of the Kamusul Alam. I actually 
uh, traveled to Istanbul uh, from Manisa a couple of months ago. Like once I had um, applied to this conference, uh, I uh, went to the uh, Islamic Studies uh, Center uh, run by uh, run by Janet, the, the sort of religious affairs uh, director of, of, of Turkey. One of the major research centers of, of Istanbul and of Turkey in general, and they have the six volume uh, collection as well, uh, whose covers actually look a little bit different. But what matters, of course, is what's inside, and what's inside uh, is is the same uh, in uh, both cases. I should add, of course, that PDFs of the Kamus of Alam are available, uh, but I decided to actually go to these two libraries and, and use the real thing because there's something about the tangible mm -hmm. artifact that just um, sort of appeals to the perhaps the Luddite in me or, the, or, the, or, or to something quixotic in me. But in any case, the author of the entire thing, uh, approximately 5,000 pages in, in, in six volumes, is, is the man uh, seated here with his wife, uh, who has two names because he essentially has two identities. And it's, it's worth going into that just a little bit before we go on to actually hear what he had to say about what is now uh, Belarus. Uh, because um, he was an ethnic Albanian uh, who lived towards the uh, end of the uh, Ottoman Empire and died before its dissolution. Uh, although his children, his sons, were then to see the Republican era, and, and, and one of them was to become prominent in the Republican era uh, as uh, one of the founders, still in the Ottoman era, of the major Turkish football club, Galatasaray, because, you know, one of the three big Istanbul uh, clubs, along with Senebak and, and, and Bishkek. Uh, and uh, so, so that son was called Ali Sami Yen. Uh, but as far as I know, none of his sons actually went into the sort of polymath man of letters, uh, sort of um, genius of literature type persona that that Chinsu Bin Sami had successfully built up uh, for himself. So he was a scholar in a in a multitude of languages. I mean, in, in many ways, he was a representative par excellence uh, of his sort of uh, social class uh, and of his sort of milieu in. Istanbul, of course, he, he's been born uh, in what is now Albania in this village called Prasha, uh, which, which was a town back then. Since then, it's been demoted to a village of uh, approximately 300 people now. Uh, and as a lot of people in the Ottoman Empire who wanted to advance, first of all, in terms of education, and then, and then secondly, in terms of career prospects, actually not only among Muslims, but also uh, equally among Christians, among ethnic Bulgarian Christians, for example. Uh, as, as many of these people did, he moved uh, to, uh, to Istanbul, where he acquired his education and his erudition, uh, and so on. And um, so he was able to single-handedly write this encyclopedia, which, as I, as I mentioned already, was the first encyclopedia written in the uh, Turkish language, he also produced the first dictionary, what, what is considered to be the first modern dictionary of the uh, Turkish language. Uh, he also produced a dictionary, um, uh, well, essentially an Arabic dictionary, Arabic to Turkish uh, dictionary, and also a French to Turkish dictionary. Started working on an Albanian dictionary, but then once a friend of his uh, beat him to it, he decided to, to, to drop the matter and, and let his friend uh, dictionary take the laurel. Uh, and he really found himself wishing that he could also compile, compile a Kurdish dictionary. And the only thing that stopped him is the fact that he didn't know Kurdish at all. But had he known it, you know, he would have been happy to, to, to add to the World Scholarship in that regard as well. In addition to all of that, he also wrote the first, uh, certainly the first romance novel in Turkish. And according to some analysts, actually the very first novel uh, in uh, in the Turkish language, and while doing all of that, he also managed to uh, to 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 become the man who is seen as one of the founding fathers of the ideology of Albanian nationalism. And to understand how all of those things could be combined, we have to look at uh, what the Ottoman Empire looked like uh, at the turn of the 20th century, and you can see it on the map here. Uh, I mean, I, I, I should just add to that map that Bosnia at this point was under Austro-Hungarian occupation. So yes, it was considered to be part of the Ottoman Empire, but in effect had uh, slipped from, from the grasp of the Ottoman Empire. So the Ottoman Empire at this stage was at its most Muslim in terms of its uh, demographics. 
uh, because many of the uh, Christian provinces or Christian territories had simply broken away and, and the, the, the last um, wave of, of, of uh, countries breaking away from the Ottoman Empire had been the result of the Russo-Ottoman War of 1877 to 78, uh, when the Russians had intervened uh, in, in the Ottoman Empire, uh, creating uh, an autonomous uh, Bulgaria, uh, and, and uh, at this point, Romania, Serbia, and Montenegro, took the, which already had been autonomous Christian provinces within the Ottoman Empire, took the opportunity to escape from the uh, Ottoman Empire and become independent uh, states. Now, what about Albania at this stage? You know, Greece had become independent from the Ottoman Empire in the 1820s. It was sort of the first representative of this uh, ideology of ethnic nationalism that had essentially been imported from, from uh, Western uh, Europe. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and Greece, although its new identity was based on uh, ethnicity rather than religion, to a lot of Greeks, Orthodox Christian and Greek had an equal sign between them. Therefore, a lot of Greeks considered Orthodox Christian Albanians to also be Greeks who just happened to speak a different language, but you would send them to school, teach them Greek, and it would all be sorted out. Uh, a lot of people in the Balkans also equated the words Muslim and Turk. Uh, and this is something that Shams bin Sami, being an Albanian Muslim Ottoman patriot, uh, resented uh, because uh, he, he, he um, actually ended up in this encyclopedia writing a longer article on, um, on ethnic Albanians than the one that he wrote about ethnic Turks, right? He wanted to show everybody that the Albanians were a separate uh, ethnicity. Uh, so to prevent the Albanians from being assimilated into into the Turkish ethnic community or indeed the Greek ethnic community, now that self-identification was moving from the realm of religion into the realm of ethnicity, uh, he um, uh, uh, wrote uh, among his other works, uh, a sort of uh, guides to how uh, a, a, an Albanian nation could be created. I mean, first of all, uh, these different Albanian speaking provinces could be combined into one and then some sort of autonomy could be applied for, but it was never a separate issue, never actually in. Uh, to separate Albania from the rest of the Ottoman Empire, which is why uh, he's lionized today, you know, in both Turkey and both and Albania, and, and, and he's seen by the people of both countries as certainly one of uh, their own. So this is what the inside of one of these um, volumes uh, looks like. This just happens to be the uh, the second volume. And now let's look at what he actually had to say about what we today know as uh, Belarus. So such a place as Belarus, it, it will not come as a surprise to you, was unknown to him in the 1880s to, uh, to 1890s. Uh, but the actual area uh, where Belarus is located today, uh, where something called Belarus was declared in 1918, that area uh, was known to him from all the reading that, that he did in, in, in multiple sources. And he used, he used French sources largely when writing about Europe, but not exclusively. And so he was able, for example, he doesn't mention where he learned about this, but he was able to find out how many uh, cities in what is today Belarus, for example, had local Belarusian Tatar communities, which is something that as an Ottoman is quite interested in, and something that I, I very much doubt French encyclopedias would have written about, right? Because you it, 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 it kind of um, uh, this multitude of sources uh, to produce something that would be interesting to his primary intended readership, you know, which was which was uh, highly educated. Ottoman Muslims of all kinds of different backgrounds uh, in Istanbul. Uh, and not necessarily Muslims alone, because of course, uh, educated ethnic Greeks, Bulgarians, and others in Istanbul, uh, you know, would have been um, uh, certainly able to, to, to read this book in, in Ottoman uh, Turkish uh, as well. Um, he does, um, he, he certainly talks about Russia as in the Russian Empire. He, he has two articles about Russia, actually, one about the Russian Empire as a state and one about Russia as a geographical reality. But he also has uh, articles uh, about Lithuania as in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania uh, and also in Poland as, as sort of historical uh, entities uh, that were then later subsumed um, largely into, into, uh, into Russia. Uh, and when it comes to the major cities that, that can be found today in, in, in Belarus, uh, he, he either describes them frustratingly, just say to me as a, as a Belarusian, 
he describes them either as a city lying in the west of Russia or as a city lying in the northwest of Russia or as a city lying in that part of Russia, which is known as Lithuania, or as a city lying in the Polish region of Russia, right? Well, <laughs> one of these four kinds of, kinds of things. Uh, so here he, he, he's talking about, uh, about Brest, uh, which in Ottoman Turkish he calls Brest, actually, which must come from Brest in, in, in Polish. But it's not really the Polish name nor the French. Is this kind of kind of mixed up an Ottoman Turkish name seemingly? Uh, just a little bit of a quote to yeah to give you an uh, an idea of what it sounded like. Yeah? So he describes the city this way: Ekseri Yahudi olmak üzere 23 bin ehalisi bir kayanın üzerinde kalesi ve meşhur bir havrası vardı which means that um, this is a city that is mostly Jewish. Uh, and uh, it has a population of 23,000 people. And on top of a rock, it has a fortress. Obviously, that's what everybody in the to this day mostly knows about Brest, is that it has the Brest fortress. And also, in addition to that, it has a, a, famous, um, a famous synagogue. Now, obviously, uh, that synagogue, unfortunately, was, uh, were, were, was turned into a movie theater afterwards. In the, in the Soviet era, but but back then, uh, this is something you know. The synagogue was famous enough for information about it to reach the uh, Ottoman Empire, as you can uh, see. Uh, then he um, he 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 goes on uh, to talk about Grodna, which he calls uh, well. He either calls it Grodno or Grodno. Hard to tell because the the Arabic letter Rhein in Ottoman Turkish could be read as either one. It could be read as Rhein or Gain, right? So it could mean Grodno or Grodno, but there was also a Ga letter, right? But so, so, so this one has an ambiguous pronunciation, whereas the Ga would definitely have produced a G sound, right? So this one, we're not, we're not uh, sure about, but this is one of those cities where he points out uh, that there is a neighborhood in Grodno which has, uh, which has um, sort of ethnic Tatar Muslim inhabitants, right? Uh, he, he says, bir mahallesi Muslim Tatarlar Tatarlara meskundu, right? So he points out that these are not just Tatars; these are Muslim uh, Tatars, and, and they occupy one of the uh, one of the neighborhoods uh, of of Grodna. He also talks about uh, about the Belavetska Pucha uh, actually as, as as lying in the Grodna uh, governorate, uh, and um, and he talks about the bison there, and he says about the Belavetska Pucha that even though Hunting wolves there is strictly forbidden. Every single year, the population of wolves in the Belarus Kapucha keeps going down. And it shows that you know, people aren't actually uh, keeping to, uh, to, the, to the ban. But uh, when, he, when he discusses the population structure of the Rodna governorate, uh, he says that it includes Russians, Lithuanians, uh, Poles, Germans, uh, and, uh, and, and Tatars. Um, and uh, Tatars and others. And of course, like the Jews, he wouldn't have considered them an ethnic group, he would consider them a religious group. So he also lists like the different religious groups who are, who are present there. Uh, you I'm will sorry notice- to interrupt yeah. about five minutes. Sure, thank you. Uh, you will notice here that there's one group that he does not mention, and that is the Belarusians. Uh, and, and, and the reason for that, I will, I will uh, mention briefly just at the very end uh, of my talk. Um, well, then he goes on to talk about uh, about Mahilov. So I'm going in the uh, alphabetical order of the Arabic alphabet here. He he goes on to talk about Mahilo, which, as you can see, he uses the the French spelling, which sort of mirrors the earlier sort of Polish spelling of Mohilev. Uh, in Ottoman Turkish, he calls it Mohilev with a with a fa uh, at the at the end. Uh, and um, there um, he uh, he talks about the fact that. Uh, during the summer, uh, temperatures can reach uh, 31 degrees Celsius there, but in winter, it can go down to minus 35 degrees Celsius, which is, you know, a, a sort of a, a temperature span, which is perhaps quite shocking to an Ottoman person sitting in Istanbul, which is very balmy compared to, uh, compared to Belarus, even though it's on the colder side compared to other parts of uh, Turkey. Uh, he talks about the different kinds of um, agricultural products uh, grown in the Mahilo uh, governorate, uh, you know, flax and also you know, uh, barley and rye uh, and oats uh, and, um, uh, and and those kinds of um, uh, things. Uh, and uh, he also points out, uh, you know, the, the numbers of, 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 of churches and, and synagogues. So, for example, there are two synagogues 
29, as you said, Russian churches, three Catholic churches, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and he goes on to, to Minsk, and in Minsk, he also points out that there is a whole uh, Tatar Muslim neighborhood and a mosque. So it is really quite interesting. I mean, this is a mosque you know, that was uh, demolished in the communist era, actually quite late under Khrushchev. Uh, and then was recently just rebuilt and uh, President Erdogan uh, went to the inauguration uh, of, uh, of this mosque. This mosque was not just known to Erdogan, but, but what, the, the, the previous mosque, which, which actually is uh, where, um, uh, is it the Jubilina Hotel? Anyway, the, 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 yeah, the, the, uh, the, the, the hotel is on top of the mosque. And so the graveyard that was next to the mosque is where the new uh, mosque is. But the interesting thing is that in the late 19th century, this mosque, uh, was known uh, to uh, to the uh, to the Ottoman. Uh, well, fi final thing about uh, about me, you know, didn't talk about Vichyk, but sort of similar things to 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 what you said about the other uh, cities. About Minsk, uh, it's interesting that he points out that it is becoming an industrial uh, center. Uh, at this point in the late 19th century, apparently there were. 3,000 factory workers uh, in Minsk, which, which seems awfully low, but uh, I mean, it is just sort of the beginning of industrialization and, 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 and sort of urbanization uh, in, in what is now the world. Uh, but he points out actually that like uh, the, um, that Minsk is on the um, intersection of, of two different railways uh, and that it does a sort of export certain things, but in a very limited way, because it says the economy is actually quite backward. And he says about other cities in Belarus too, that like uh, the education system is backward. He keeps using this word backward, Geri in, in Turkish, to refer to, to what is now Belarus multiple times. And, uh, so means being backward results, he says, in it producing mostly alcoholic drinks in, in its 300 <laughs> factors. Uh, but uh, so the final thing I want to say uh, is the reason why he does not mention Belarusians in his list of ethnicities, you know, living in Rodna government, for example. It's because to him, uh, sort of following the, uh, the official <laughs> ideology of the Russian empire at the time, there, was, there wasn't such a thing as a separate Belarusian people, but there was a triune Russian people. And this he talks about in his article in Russia. He says the Russian people have been divided into three parts. And these are the great Russians, the lesser Russians, and the white Russians. And for the white Russians, he uses a, a term in French, uh, which isn't used any longer, but was used uh, in, in, in times contemporary to him, which is blanc russien. Today you say le Belarus, uh, le, le Bielorus, but not blanc russien, right? But, but that was uh, the term used back then. And so uh, he, he mentions that once and doesn't feel the need to, to then point out that, you know, the Russians living in this particular area were the white kind, not the other kind, et cetera. Uh, uh, but yes, it is, it is a quite interesting and in fact, um, surprising to me, uh, you know, the, uh, to, 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 to find out the extent of the knowledge that uh, uh, people in the Ottoman Empire in the 1890s would say had access to, uh, you know, regarding what we know today as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Rashid. Uh, our next presenter today is Angela Espinosa Ruiz, who is a, an assistant professor at the University of Warsaw. Her main research areas are comparative literature, contemporary Belarusian poetry, and epiphany. Among her latest publications are the following articles Barbara Kwopish, uh, an exophonist from Lodz uh, with a Palace Harp. We heard, therefore, we are Nasta Kudasova's protest poetry, 2020-2021, New York and homesickness in Rigor Krushina's poetry, the motives of the apple and god in the poetry collection The Fourth Guard by Galina Tvaranovich. And to add to that, uh, it's, uh, um, it's important to, to say that uh, Angela is also a poet in her own right award-winning poet and an author of a uh, uh, book um, poetry collection. You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much for the lovely presentation to the organizers for inviting me and making this possible for all of you who are here or online. I just think I have to stop the previous presentation so that I can share my, my slides. <laughs> <laughs> this is very interesting and has very little to do with Beautiful by Tolkien. Thank you very much. Okay. 
So what have to do here? And it should be visible now. <coughs> so today I would like to just take a gander and introduce you to Smith and Bartosik. Most of you will know Smith and Bartosik. I wanted to introduce him from a different point of view. I have been doing re research on exophony for a couple of years now. And I do think that looking at Mitha Bartosik as someone who writes and acts, performs, and uh, sings in a language that's different from his own will allow us to look into Belarusian literature more from a post-colonial point of view, since this is more or less a Soviet cultural transfer. Mitha Bartosik moved from Soviet Russia to Soviet Belarus, which was at the time the same country functionally, officially, but it implies a change of paradigm, I would say. So about Mitha Bartosik, you can see him here for a pretty recent photograph, so you can see what he looks like about now. Yeah. He... <laughs> oh, it's been here. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's no, great. No, so just a, just a refresh. <laughs> very handsome fella. So also very under-researched fella, because uh, I do think that philologists and uh, academics that do literature studies tend to overlook both non-fiction and music authored songs and some poetry as genres. This has to be remedied. It's been remedied in the West, has to come from the East as well. And even though he has been a considerable cultural influence in the Belarusian panorama since the 1990s, if not earlier, uh, he has been largely overlooked by academics. I looked on Google Scholar and there was literally nothing I could base my research on. So this is all my own. As I was saying, the meaning of exophony, more on that in a, in a minute. He adopted and embraced the Belarusian language and with it the culture and the literature that came with it and the symbolic apparatus that actually comes with the Belarusian language combined with a more worldwide perspective that he does give to his work. He goes from the very personal to the universal through natural testimonies. I will pass a bit around in, in a bit so that you can see for yourself. Mm. And of course, his image, his existence has a symbolic dimension. He is one of the foreigners who have embraced and helped create and develop the Belarusian culture in the latest decade. So we will see a bit more on that. So, more on the man and the symbol. So, as a person, he moved to Belarus when he was in his preteen years, of the formative years, anyway, but he was not obligated to fully integrate into the Belarusian educational system. He was not required to attend the Belarusian language and literature lesson. He had a discount in history lessons and he made full use of that. <laughs> you talk to him, he will tell you that he used to go and try to drink beer from the earliest stage possible with another Russian boy who's standing with him at this point. Ironically enough, both of them are proficient in Belarusian today and use Belarusian as the main, main language of communication in their daily lives, unlike the rest of the group. <laughs> so I would like to touch on the multimedia adoption of Belarusian culture that he undertook. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you can see it, the Zoom column. Yeah, that is better. I have attached a link. If we have time, I'll go back to this. This is Mitra Bartosik's reading of an audiobook, Jeton na Metro by Andrei Fedorenka. Um, and he literally gives a voice to those Belarusians, not only Belarusians that he interviews in his non fiction work, mostly 
uh, powered by radio liberty Radio Moloba, but also to those Belarusian writers who don't have the voice to read their own audiobooks and to send them as well as me to the book it does, to that to command. So that's another layer that we have to, to take into account. And because it reaches more people, not everyone reads, not everyone in the latest generation, younger generations is keen on reading, really. Sad, but it's true, and we have to make do with that new reality. Myth by Joseph reaches out to everyone, those who like books shall have their texts, those who like long drives and listening to audiobooks and podcasts can go to Myth by Joseph and the Revolution language as well. And those who are just into music will find something for themselves in Smith's Bicultural Creations. So, both in his words and in his deeds, as a person who is a down to earth writer, a man who has a fantastic sense of humor, and he is very respectful of all people, it's really visible and may show for a second the way that his interview is a portrait, mm -hmm. it's fantastic. Um, he keeps the appellatives that they use, this Tiotka Renya, so mm -hmm. people in the village call, call her auntie, so it could be auntie, there's someone called Miss as well, Mr. And it doesn't matter who, who they are, these are just fantastic mm -hmm. portraits of the people who lent, them, uh, lent him their stories really. So as a symbol, he is a representative of Belarusian intelligentsia, of course. As I was saying, he provides anonymous Belarusians with a voice in the same way that most recent example of this is Lana Alexievich, who is less Belarusian centered, perhaps and more post-Soviet state centered. And as such, he has become a keeper of sorts. For Belarusian culture, Belarusian history, Belarusian dialect. That's why I know my colleague here has done a lot of research on, on dialect. He keeps the Trasyanka in his thoughts, he keeps the Russian words, he <coughs> keeps different types of writing, including Narkamoga. He uses Tarashkevich for himself. I'll talk about that. And most importantly, perhaps, he gives Belarusian, Belarusian, uh, the mention of universal projection. The very title of this book, Zabit Upalmin Lava, I'll explain who that is in a minute, who were killing. <laughs> well, it's a paper, paper project, anyway. Uh, it's resonant with Happy Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm -hmm. I mean, that way he fixates the interculturality that Belarus and Belarusian culture is integrated, it should be integrated in, and puts it on the same level as the things he references, it's referring to French culture and history, Napoleon, for example, this is old man in a village whose name was Napoleon. His name. <laughs> <laughs> the, the way he names his chapters, it looks like. It doubles as a reference to different cultures and, and times. Uh, his voice itself is a cultural weapon, both in song and audiobook. And um, here I have allowed myself to introduce a question which Mitra Barthes is fully integrated into Belarusian culture. Do Belarusians look for validation in him? What do I mean by validation? Those of us who are foreigners who have embraced Belarusian culture and work with it. So after the question why Belarus, why Belarusian, the question that I get the most, and I think many of you will agree, is what does your nation think of Belarusians? Mm -hmm. And maybe your nation doesn't think of Belarusians at all. So maybe by it is a remedy to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no way. Oh, and it's often what I wanted to say and why Mitra by it is key for Belarusian post-colonial studies is that an exoctonist is a writer who chooses a language that's not his own country, his own nation, to write in. And as such, 
thing that Belarus was Soviet when Smetsu Bartosik was born and he, he moved to Soviet Belarus. He didn't move countries exactly. Really, there could be a bit of discussion. Could, can we consider Smetsu Bartosik an autochronist? Uh, I do think so, because there was a separation between the Russians that had moved to Belarus and ethnic Belarusians who did have to study one way or another the language, culture, literature, watered down, adapted to Soviet reality, but nevertheless. So I am indeed considering things as a topic and it's open. So we can go back if I don't run out of time. About for example, the Belarusian language. Native Bartosik's proficiency in Belarusian is native level. Those of you who have spoken to him know he himself, both in informal communication and his writing, of course, his radio Slobodas, as you know, he used Karashkevica, which is very much the tradition for the diasporas, most of them anyway, the old diasporas, not after 2020 perhaps. <laughs> He won't shy away from Russian or words that are similar to Russian have, that have a more Belarusian purist equivalent, like he will use Tarakanin for the Prusaki, for cockroaches, <laughs> for instance. He mocks Russian language, he uses Krasyanka, this mix of Russian and Belarusian, for example. Ya ničevo jesti nevazmo. I'm sorry for monolingual English speakers, I cannot convey how, how funny this sounds. Uh, he will use very expressive words, like ech, ach, and even vulgarism, special to shaku hernu. And that's how he writes it. <laughs> it's in the book, it's a quote, page 11. If you want to take a gander. <laughs> Mm -hmm. He uses Narkanoka in documents that he quotes directly, it doesn't change into Tarashkevica, it's the official writing, academic writing of Belarusian language. He will use Latin, aha, what's your name, that's Belarusian, and then religious, not knitting, not Polish, not knitting, Russian. And then this Upal Minza, Upal Namochene Ministerstva Zagatovak, and that's the hated paper pusher that the village wants to kill him. I'll try to get by with a few spoilers if possible. <laughs> As him, he uncovers in this book, which is the third part of our theology, Tadaroje Zvavode, Travels of Freedom. He uncovers documents and testimonies of very no, uh, little known facts of Belarusian history, science of fact, we are writing in Triroka. And that's a quote by a radio library, I'm not going to read because I don't want to, I, I do want to have time for questions, comments, and passing around with the book. So about his writing, I have chosen three aspects that I would like to touch upon. Sense of humor is integral to, to his writing and his life, tends towards self-deprecation, ironic, sarcastic, rather pessimism, and it pokes fun at the pompous circumstance of Soviet and post-Soviet culture. And here we have a couple of quotes, I don't know how much, pokes fun at his friends and himself, Sergei Karelsky, who as a brother introduced him to suitable young ladies that he could eventually marry. He was worried that his friend was married at the time. And about the names of people came with it. He told Vranislava, Vresta, Vranita. So this directly, people had traditional Polish, Slavic sounding historical names. And you can read that as Kazyol Ivan, which is an insult. Kazyol mm -hmm. is a very bad word in Russian, really. <laughs> <laughs> Probably it was Kozel. I'm not sure, it's left ambiguous. <laughs> so. You both the Velika Stalin and love for the great Stalin, uh, Moscow of the heart, and etc. etc. It's so sarcastic. So. History and culture is paramount. He writes takes a sarcastic approach to it as well. But he hides fairness of truth in it anyway, which is how we get to the readers. He hooks you 
with the humor and then you've left thinking for an hour and a half. <laughs> what did I just do? I have to post this. I have to post that. Yeah, that's a quote that I like. Mm-hmm. Pakul ya mois no ye fra svayu zemlyu mosna tolki maris. That's a reference, of course, to Jakub Kolas, Novaya Zemlya. Jakub Kolas, whose father dreamt of buying his own plot of land and being free. So while the Soviet state exists, you can only dream about this land, not buy it, not get it. Чем больше измена богата белору белорусского человека белорусская мова, тем менее у им советской насторожности. So the better a Belarusian Belarusian language is, the fewer Soviet negative uh, traits they will have, really. Start uh, holding that. There's also references to international happenings, lots of defense of the Belarusian language as a cultural weapon once again. And on his moral values, I can sum them up like that. Respect, dignity, and universal human rights, <laughs> which is pretty dangerous in Belarus. That's why he had to run away. <laughs> it's worse so now. And yes, so here are some quotes that actually dignify the simple folk, prostinarod in Belarus. Uh, they, the government officials, were used to different behavior from the simple folk, to obedience, to humility, to silence, but not to fight, to, to them to can fight back. Uh -huh. So talking about the unfairness of trials as well. Uh, yeah, so about specific people. I wanted to show you about three minutes. Now. Three minutes. Okay, so maybe I'll just pass the book around you can see the portraits of them. And to conclude, three minutes. Smith <laughs> uh, and Bartosis remains under research. I hope to remedy that. I hope that I have inspired you to look into his work from a more academic, scientific point of view. He is relevant both individually as an author and from the social linguistic perspective. And exophonic authors internationalized Belarusian literature and enabled us to cast light on the position of the country, the language, and the culture in the world, not just in Europe. And with Peter Bartosi, we have to go from the personal and particular to the universal. Uh, so each village or each living testimony that he reflects on his book take us to again respect dignity and human rights. And authors in Belarus have to be considered from a twofold point of view. They are not just creators of work, they themselves are works in progress, which reveals the Belarusian nation since we were talking about that. Yesterday, thank you very much. I will be delighted to take questions, not just today, but my email Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. And now we will move on to our final speaker. Today uh, is Christian Roncero who is a postdoctoral researcher in linguistics at the University of Sheffield. His work focuses primarily on languages of the former Soviet Union, with a special emphasis on Belarus. Christian is currently carrying out research on small Slavic varieties in contact with larger ones. His main research interests include morphology, typology, linguistic fieldwork, and social linguistics. He has published several papers on West Palesian morphosyntax, but he is also the compiler of the first digital archive of Hamalal, a language of Dagestan, Russian folk. And Christian's title today is Enigmatic Overabundance in Belarusian and Ukrainian Varieties. Welcome, Christian. Thank you, Pilot, very much. Thank 
Yep. Uh, oh. Can the people that are online see me moving slides? Yes or no? Good. Good. Uh, whoops. Okay. Right. Um, well, good morning, everyone. Um, I know this is the, the last talk, the hardest one, the Bloody Mary talk. Uh, <laughs> That we are tired and it being a long uh, session. Um, I I work in linguistics, as Karen was introducing, um, and language can be something very theoretical and practical. So I am neurodivergent and I hate um, listening to these talks, and especially for people that are not that familiar with linguistics. I'm gonna try my best to make it more or less understandable. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I'm going to be talking today about overabundance, which is a phenomenon in morphology, um, so structure of the language, when we get more than one form for the same function. For example, in English, the past tense of burn, uh, like burning, is burnt or burn. And they are both equivalent. You can use them um, in any context, and there's no, not an issue with that. So, I'm going to be studying, I'm currently studying actually this work in progress of what is happening with small Slavic varieties versus big language. So I'm going to start by defining what overabundance means. Um, and then going to move on to the specific settings where the languages and dialects, varieties, call them whatever you want, are spoken in Belarus, Ukraine and Poland mostly, and how I'm covering my study. And some very, 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 very early results, but I'm still in the middle of the study. So, um, you know, like the song, uh, <laughs> right, so um, I'm gonna start by trying to explain overabundance. For that, I need to explain what inflectional morphology is. So, Let's say that languages are like small Lego bricks, like very small. Most of the time we only focus, you only see the big brick, but nevertheless, they are still there. And so these little bricks get together to make words and then these words together make sentences and paragraphs and so on and so forth. So let's say that every, little, every word can be composed of smaller pieces. And so each small change, like the verb to be in English, would be a new brick. Some of these bricks might look the same, but very often, like in English, I am, she is, um, there is a difference. They look a bit different. Um, these blocks get together and form structures um, otherwise called or known as paradigm. So in some languages, such as in English, these structures are pretty, pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, there's not much to do. However, in some languages, uh, this gets more complicated. For example, in Belarus, in Belarusian, we have more morphology. The structures get more complicated. And, and in some languages in the world, these morphology, these structures get really, 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 really complicated. Um, and this is part of what I'm studying, this complexity in these structures. There are many ways in how these structures can get crazy and diverse. Uh, one of them is overabundance. Overabundance is basically getting more than what you need, technically. So in an ideal world, we would see um, a grade every, every word, every structure would have, every block would have a specific place on the structure and it would be unique, unlike anything else and only one in one place. So for example, in English, as I said, however, this is far from reality. For example, in English, the past tense of burn is burnt or burn. 
Let me show you with a uh, Belarusian example. So this is uh, the Belarusian corpus. Um, the, the word for form, um, form um, can have uh, two uh, instrumental singular forms and two genitive plural forms. The instrumental uh, form is a bit less common, but the genitive plural form or formal is used all the time. And I can show you texts and articles by linguists, Belarusian linguists, writing in Belarusian where they keep using one or the other all the time. There is no dialectal difference. There is no stylistic difference, no diastratic. So it doesn't mean there's no difference between written and spoken. They are used basically broadly, um, you know, up to your present. Um, so there are some issues with overabundance. I've told you in an ideal world, the way we'd like to describe grammar traditionally, we want things to be nitty gritty. We want to give you a, a table where there's only one form and everything is in it. However, you know, uh, language is a bit more complicated than our expectations and our obsessions with order. The problem with that is um, overabundance has attracted attention over the past decade. Um, and in the past, well, grammars would try to sweep the dust under the carpet. And whenever they try to explain why, why is that, that you get more than one form for the same cell, well, they would try to find very dry, well, I mean, language internal explanations. They would try to think about the etymology of these words, there were some sound changes here, there was suppletion and heteroclesis here and there. Um, however, I, because I work with endangered languages and non-standard forms and dialects, I realized that actually this is very, 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 very common uh, in my work. There was um, a, a, an American linguist who's worked a lot in, um, in Scotland with Scott Gaelic, uh, Nancy Dorian, um, working with these really remote and non-standardized communities um, to realize that actually certain environments can create a climate where we preserve this. So in more standardized uh, societies where we, we've been schooled uh, with a specific grammar, where we try to delimit, like this is language, and then don't even bother, or like don't even dare to say this or that. This is the norm. Whereas in communities in the world, like which is like the vast majority of languages, where we don't have academies and bodies to regulate you, overabundance is just very common. Um, specifically, um, when everybody is poor, belongs more or less to the same social class. Um, then there is no really need to, you know, show up. Um, there is another recent study uh, with Australian um, where she's showing that actually multilingualism, or more specifically diglossia, which is a type of multilingualism, can have um, an effect on overabundance. So diglossia is when we have one or more languages or forms, or varieties, uh, but they compete. They have they are spoken in the same society, but they have different functions. For example, uh, Trasyanka would be fine to be spoken with your family, but don't ever use Trasyanka on TV unless you are a president. Uh, <laughs> there is some function, some expectation that if you are highly educated, um, you are at university, you will use either Russian or standard Belarusian, whereas at home, do whatever you want. This is what is called diagnosis. Um, and as I'm going to show you, the settings where I work are even more complex than that. There's also a problem that um, there's a strong bias towards weird uh, languages and weird societies. So, weird stands for Western educated industrialists, um, rich and democratic which is a tiny fraction of the world population uh, outside of you know, our wide Western academia, the world is a lot more complex. And so 
the generalizations we make about uh, morphology <clears throat> should be a bit more considerate of what is outside of our tiny white bubble. Um, so I'm working, I'm trying to work with two settings, although policy is in my heart. Uh, the first region is uh, Rusin or Ruthenian, uh, which is poking up across four national uh, borders. The most interesting for me are these three, Slovakia, Poland, and Ukraine. So it is one ethnic group. Of course, they are dialects, they are varieties, but because of these national borders have been there for over the past 70, 80 years, um, and people have been schooled in different languages, their exposure um, to what its language should look like is having an effect on how they speak. That is called um, a border effect. And there is some literature on that. Um, Conversely, and I'm also working on Western policy, which is like where I spend most of my time. Um, it's a tiny little fraction of Poland, known as Podlasia, southwestern Belarus, mostly the Brest region and the Polin region in Ukraine. Um, traditionally, West Poli Western policy was very much isolated because when there's no melt, uh, everything gets flooded and you could only move by boat inside of some villages. So it was quite isolated even from like traveling inside villages was crazy, not even to speak about traveling abroad. Um, until, you know, they started on the 70s and 80s with Melioratia, where they started draining the marshes and, and making roads. Uh, the thing is, as a result, people are leaving to the cities. And at the same time, they've been educated, they are being exposed to different languages. So traditionally in Western policy, with this isolation, they've developed their own variety, call it language, strong dialect. Um, yeah, doesn't matter. The thing is they are being exposed to multiple standards, but none of them are there. So the older generation where I work, they were schooled in Polish because that was part of their Red Sport Polita until 37. Then the few that went to school during World War II, some of them were schooled in Ukrainian, but then with, uh, you know, the Soviet Union um, liberating uh, occupied Belarus, some were schooled in Belarusian, and other in Russian. So they've been exposed to multiple languages over their life. They listen to illegal radio and TV from Belarus, but then others, they listen to Ukrainian as well. And so there are multiple uh, languages they are exposed to, but none of them is their language. Speaking West Polish is still nowadays highly, highly stigmatized in Belarus. Uh, this is uh, the region of Podlasie in Poland, which is slightly similar, also very highly multilingual. I was last uh, summer for Yavlochin Fest, uh, which is um, an Orthodox feast of the holy apple. And basically, this is an Orthodox cemetery. So only Orthodox people are buried here. But even within the same cemetery, I managed to see how diverse it was. People from the same family. Uh, so you would have here like ultra Slavonic. Uh, this family has their name uh, Maximiuk in Belarusian or in Polacian. Uh, but then you see Vichna uh, Pamet in Russian. Uh, here you've got this Antosiuk. They write it in Polish and then in Russian, uh, Polish and Russian, or this is ultra Slavonic, Podlasian, Russian. And they are basically exposed to multiple varieties, although well, these are a bit of a special family that they use the, you know, the local variety, but all of the others are not there. And so my hypothesis is that this environment is where you're going to get lots of overabundance on the paradigm, basically because you can borrow from all your neighbors. Um, for that, um, I've been, well, my research question is, yes, do minoritized or diglossic languages varieties get more overabundance than standardized uh, languages? And so I've set a list of 65 parameters 
uh, where Slavic languages tend to differ or have problems. Uh, so for example, here's the paradigm, the first person singular pronoun, me, I, uh, mine. So as you see in these, uh, the genitive, the dictative, and the instrumental, there are differences like <clears throat> between, um, <clears throat> sorry, between uh, different Slavic languages. So why pick this? Because if you are a, a non-standard language, uh, then, and you've got at least two or three different forms, it is a lot easier to control where you have borrowed. About five minutes. Yeah, great. Um, I've been using to elicit this, um, it is very hard. So I've been using uh, on the one hand online corpora, but for the field work part, um, I've been, I'm, and I'm using um, visual stimuli. So I give them um, wordless books and I ask them to tell me a story. That way, uh, instead of asking them the paradigm, how do you say cat to the cat? I'd rather let them tell me the story. So then I thought at least the cat appears about 10 times. So if they're using the word cat 10 times, chances are at some point, they're gonna be using two or three different forms. And as well, I can compare it with what other speakers are using within the same village, within the same household. You would be surprised how much variation there is. Um, so I've been, basically going through, this is the fieldwork part. On the other hand, uh, I'm going through all the online corpora and checking for these parameters, collecting up to six different words, like very common words that are cognates in all Slavic languages and see if I find that there is overabundance or in the corpus people have been using both, I mark a one, otherwise they get a zero. Um, so far, uh, yeah. And I'm putting them all together and seeing who gets the highest. So far, I mean, this is not finished. I'm still lacking a lot of data for Rusin because the corpus is very, very small and West Polesian. But still, Port Lashen is top, top uh, on the list, not surprisingly. So it's confirming a hypothesis. But I got an unexpected surprise. Belarusian is very high. Um, so on the one hand, yeah, this seems to confirm my hypothesis. Um, there are a couple of reasons why Belarusian scores higher. On the one hand, it's because Belarusian orthography is a lot more transparent than Russian or Ukrainian. So in Belarusian, very often when you change stress, you have to change the vowel completely. Um, so for example, in Russian, Many people say the nominative plural vada, water, they would say vodi or vadi, but in the written, you wouldn't see that. Whereas in Belarusian, if you make that difference, uh, you, you must reflect that on the spelling. And then this is one thing that, that will appear on the surface. Um, there's also um, a, a less social base for Belarusian and than uh, for Russian or Ukrainian because the the still quite stigmatized speaking Belarusian um, and no many people speak it uh, especially natively and standard Belarusian. Um, however, I was afraid that the you know the double standard with Tarashkevich and Narkamovka would give me like lots of overabundance, but actually this was the less the least relevant thing for um, overabundance. So, so far, uh, this is where, like the cleanest uh, table that I have. So, Podlasian is still scoring pretty high, and so is Rusin. Belarusian still quite high if you compare it to Polish or Russian or Ukrainian. And as we say in Western Polish, we look at Jakwe. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Beautiful picture. Yeah, you can stay here, or, or Carolina, you can stay here. So, what all the speakers should be somewhere in this area. Carolina, well, uh, do you, maybe Yarok, it would be easier if you were uh, moderating the QA because I, oh, I have so many things. Sorry, but I just can't see the Don't chat. Worry, I will, I'll, I'll make you. I'll, there are things in chat I will turn people on. 
Okay. Um, I, I would rather see the screen. And if you could, oh. you're still sharing your screen? Uh, am screen? I? Oh, yes, I am. Sorry. Um, <laughs> let me unshare. So, Um, so could, how can I see the chat? Oh, I'll, I'll share the chat. Because yeah. To okay. <laughs> um, right. So uh, among those present here, um, who would like to ask any question? Uh, on overabundance, so uh, uh, does it gradually become more orderly as sort of parallel words acquire different shades of meaning or like, like for example, if you take the English language, they borrowed a lot of words and then Anglo-Saxon sort of words remained basic and French and Latin became posh, you know, so, so you have sort of parallel words, but they actually they're not parallel, just that kind of shades of meaning. So, so would it happen here as well? Do you uh, think? I'm sorry, could you introduce you? Oh, so, sorry, it's, it's pa Pavel uh, Shev, Shev, so I, one of the trustees of the library. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your question. So this is an interesting uh, point. Many, um, traditionally, they've been seeing overabundance and something unstable, that languages cannot cope with it because apparently our brains are too limited and, you know, uh, at some point they would specialize or one of them fades away. The reality is, if you look at these languages and my speakers are completely fine using three, four, five, seven different dative singular form, is not without a, a, a meaning that it, it contradicts a bit the, the traditional narrative. Um, when it comes to specific lexemes or so no forms, um, yeah, again, it's a matter of a bit the, the history and like the politics. So at some point, speaking French was prestigious in England. And at some point, Latin might have been more important. So it is, but, but that's a bit different. That's just, that's more dealing with specific synonyms or specific words. Whereas what I'm talking here is about is more the, the structure of the word itself, where traditionally, yeah, we would believe that it will disappear. What I'm trying to prove in my research is like, no, this is this is very common in world languages. This is very part of like human speech, like how we are. So yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, so I also have a question about the overabundance topic. Um, so I'm actually curious if uh, you have gotten to the point in your research where you are recommending a course of action for like codifying Belarusian or altering the codification in some way, maybe de like uh, defining certain uh, aspects of the language as being separate dialects or something like this. Because I think about um, you use English um, and the words burnt and burn burned um and in america burned is much less common than burnt uh and uh obviously american english and british english and australian english are all different dialects that would have different opinions on whether which which word to use even though they're all correct so i i guess i'm asking are you to that point in your research yet where you can suggest a course of action if, if any. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Well, um, my task is mostly describing what is there. I'm not saying this is better or, or worse. Um, this is a bit, well, the principle of linguistics you observe, you don't comment. Like we treat every variety and every, dialect or language it doesn't matter like those tags are only important politically to me they don't mean anything um i do believe however uh, grammars in general including belarusians should be more open and, and honest about the way they speak and so if people are using multiple forms they should be more it is the paradox a bit of um academy so people that want to try to 
uh, fight. They, they, they are worried that language is becoming so poor and they, you know, they want to make their language rich. Actually, when they start delimiting and saying, this is only correct, this and this and these mm -hmm. forms are only accepted, they are paradoxically making the language poorer because they are uh, probing variation. So I don't know if this answers your question. Concerning burnt and burnt, yes, it's true that there is some preference over countries, but still in the UK, uh, you would find people using both. Uh, although there is, a, you know, some preference um, by different groups, but they are still considered equivalent in any context. There's a question online. Okay. Well, it's funny to be using a microphone. I have a question for Professor McMillan sitting next to me <laughs> about Hannah Comer. And so I was thinking about her poetry also from a multimedia point of view. So I'm a big fan and she does videos and readings or her poetry gains quite a bit from uh, theatrical reciting as yeah, she, she performs. Uh, do you think there is a way that this could be analyzed in a scientific, philological manner? Well, frankly, no. But, but I'm, I'm hoping to publish an article about her um, um, early next year. We've run into a bit of a problem that one of her uh, books, although I've referred to it and used it, hasn't yet been published, but it's going to be in the summer. But uh, I'm afraid I'm very old fashioned when I look at things on, <laughs> on paper. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Also, where is my book? It's a signed copy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Now, a question from the chat. From uh, Vitalia. Vitalia, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, my question uh, is to Rashid. I am really curious about uh, the book you told. And first of all, um, I wanted to ask, um, what was the source of the uh, of this information about uh, Belarusian cities and generally about this uh, uh, tribal Russian um, nation for the author? Was, uh, did he use information from some scattered uh, Ottoman sources or maybe from his own research or it was mostly based, based on some maybe Western encyclopedia, French one? So I wonder um, what was the mediator or what was the source of this knowledge? And also, was this um, the only uh, source of information about these territories for Ottoman reader in the time, or there were also other options to learn more about this part of uh, uh, of the world? Thank you. Right. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Very good question. Uh, so um, let me let me let me start by uh, trying to answer your second question. Actually. Uh, Certainly for, uh, for Ottomans who had been educated in the schools uh, that had been widely set up um, during the rule of Sultan Abdul Hamid II, which is exactly when this encyclopedia was published. Uh, this was the period from 1876 to 1909. This was one of the longest reigns uh, in Ottoman history. Uh, during that period, uh, the Ottoman Empire saw burgeoning uh, of schools uh, and a real widening of the school system. Uh, and, um, and for the first time, uh, schools beyond sort of military preparatory schools, you know, became accessible to a large segment of the population. Uh, and uh, they had compulsory foreign language instruction and, and that essentially in practice for most of the schools meant French. Uh, Arabic was taught there as well, but it obviously wasn't a foreign language for the uh, Ottoman Empire, it was sort of the, the second most important local Muslim language after uh, after Turkish. Uh, so most of these schools essentially had a trilingual model of, of, of teaching all the subjects in, in Turkish, even in the Arab provinces, uh, but then teaching Arabic as a second language and then, and then French as a, as a third. And then some schools had German as well. 
So anybody who had graduated from those schools and then the higher schools uh, that, again, mostly were inclined towards sort of training army officers and the kinds of people who would become Ataturk and his ministers like in the later uh, generation, you know, they, they all went to schools set up under the Abdul Hamid uh, sort of regime. Um, these kinds of people, uh, you know, Ataturk, for example, could uh, speak fluent French because uh, he was the product of, uh, you know, all, all the, later, he was the product of the system, as I said, and, and there's a, an interesting video of him having a nice conversation in French with the American ambassador, like one, once he becomes the president of Turkey, and he's speaking much better French, much more fluently than the American ambassador, uh, and, and, and he wasn't unique by any means. He was, again, a, a, a representative of his class, just as uh, Sami Frashiri, to use his Albanian name, or Shemseddin Sami, to use his Turkish name, was as well. So uh, people from that sort of, uh, that sort of, let's say, educated intellectual quasi elite uh, class, uh, yes, could have uh, accessed information about Eastern Europe and, 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 and Europe more broadly and, and the rest of the world uh, in French, sometimes in German. Uh, there were even people who kind of taught themselves English using newspapers and things like that, like starting from, from uh, French or, or, or German. Um, th there were also, of course, uh, American and um, and and uh, and other uh, sort of other Western schools, so like European uh, sort of uh, church schools, missionary schools in different parts of the Ottoman Empire, including Istanbul. The most famous American one was called Robert College, which is uh, the basis for Boğaziçi University, as it's called today, which is one of the finest universities uh, in Turkey. So there were people who could access things in a variety of languages, but the average person certainly couldn't. But then the average person in the Ottoman Empire was actually illiterate. So they couldn't read Shemsuddin Sami's um, uh, encyclopedia either, right? Uh, so um, his encyclopedia really wasn't really a means, let's say, of uh, introducing people to knowledge that they couldn't otherwise access because yes, the same people who were educated in Turkish were also usually educated in French. It was rather a way to digest information coming from all kinds of different places and then to Ottomanize it. And as I was saying, to present things like a summary of things that would be actually interesting to an Ottoman uh, audience. And as for your first question, very briefly, um, I, I tried to address that in the presentation. So um, French encyclopedias were his main source uh, regarding Europe, but he also used a number of uh, different, uh, a number of different Turkish uh, authors as well. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the Ottoman tradition before the 19th century, before the, all the educational reforms and, and, and things like that, then of course there were Ottoman travelers, you know, people such as the famous Evliya Celebi of the 17th century who traveled through much of uh, Central and Eastern Europe, uh, you know, who, who for previous uh, generations of, of Ottoman uh, Muslims would have been uh, their main source of knowledge uh, about you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, the next one is Alan. Question from Alan Flowers. Um, yes, thank you. This is directed to Arnold. Um, I was very taken by his presentation, and it's so hugely important that uh, you're, you're bringing out the work of Anna Komar, uh, who I would point out is probably one of the most volubly funded chevening scholarships that uh, the Foreign Office in recent years has, has given. And um, th those of us who are uh, aware of Anna's amazing activism uh, would testify to that. Um, what I wanted to ask you, Arnold, to bring out, um, and by the way, I take your point about preferring the, the written to the visual, uh, but uh, we were honoured by having Anna stand up at Mother Language Day for Anglo-Belarusian Society and, and recite some words uh, on the same day that you yourself uh, uh, did as well. So uh, um, I, th I, th I think you have some awareness anyway of the impact uh, she makes uh, visually headed performance. Um, so my question to you, Arnold, is um, um, we, we heard a lot about her, her early period and I was very taken because you illuminated a part of Anna's life and writing. Uh, many of us will have known not, nothing of. Um, but what about this latter period, um, particularly um, since the, the war? Um, to, to what extent? I, mean, I wonder if you could just amplify on how you've seen her 
her work and her style, both in Belarusian language, because now um, she's making a major contribution communicating in the English speaking language, um, as well as continuing in Belarusian language. So how, have, have you looked at uh, in any a considerable extent her this this latter period and how any comments on how she's transitioned as she came to Britain? Well, I've met her once or twice. Am I allowed to open it? Yes. I've met her once or twice, and um, uh, I did quote one or two things from the time of uh, the repressions, but uh, I only write about things that I can actually see that is probably very limiting, but I like things on that are published rather than just out of the air. And um, really, I'm waiting for uh, her middle book, Triputnik, uh, to be published, and then I can uh, get on with that. But she's, uh, she's a very pleasant and interesting person, and very good at answering questions also. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing her, her work published uh, in Rome, where there's a very good uh, journal comes out, Rikerke Slaviski. And I published two things there already, and they're keen to have another, and they're going to have one about Hanakoma. All being well. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Could, could I be allowed an Alla there? Just more a, questions a brief, from the floor? A brief comment. Hello? Uh, my question is for Rashid. Um, I was very interested um when you were describing the different ethnicities um that like you mentioned lithuanians um and so i guess people are coming from western belarus maybe they've heard these before um my speakers often refer to belarusians as lithuanian like the lithuanians um so i wonder if you know this could be a code word for that and also um when he mentioned, well, I mean, most of the Jewish, well, I mean, most of the Jews that used to live where I, um, fortunately, they migrated or everybody knows what happened to them, but still, most of them, they used to speak Yiddish. Um, so villages were bilingual and um, that respect. So I wonder if there was also any records of, um, you know, the languages used. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I mean, yeah, that, uh, that's a great point you make. Uh, certainly, uh, I mean, even even uh, these days, you know, uh, sort of in the Belarusian uh, public sphere on Facebook, etc., there are discussions of, you know, whether we were right or mistaken to adopt the name Belarusian, whether we were just playing into the Russian game, whether we ought to have called ourselves Lithuanians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then sometimes Lithuania, Lithuanians from the Republic of Lithuania come and protest and, and, and so on. Uh, but But to him, there was a clear distinction to to Shamsuddin Sami. There was a clear distinction between uh, the Lithuanians of him of his era, whom he saw as exclusively Baltic, actually Lettish as he saw them. So so th because they were similar to the Latvians, uh, uh, versus the the triune sort of Russian uh, nation, you know, which was Slavic. So here on on this page, I've, I've circled. So here it says Slav. Uh, and and so it, for the Slavs, it says uh, Russians, you know, this many living in the Russian Empire, and then Lechs, meaning meaning Poles, of course, uh, and then other Slavs, right? And other Slavs um, that it does not include the the, the, the Belarusians and Ukrainians. Uh, and then you've got the Lets, you know, who are divided into the Lithuanians, and then the Lets proper, which are which are obviously the the Latvians, because um, Letoni in, in 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 French. And then and then he goes on to the. Uh, to the other uh, sort of peoples, and interestingly enough, um, uh, you know, uh, although when listing those ethnicities in the Hrodna region, you know, he, he doesn't talk about the Jews, but it, when when he talks about uh, the populations of cities, then he points out, you know, that in this city that that's in today's Belarus, you know, two thirds of the population was Jewish, and this one, like the majority, was Jewish. And but when listing all of the ethnicities of the Russian Empire. Uh, then he has a separate section for Semitic peoples, under whom there's one entry, which is the Jews, and then you know th th their uh, number. And then he goes on to the Finno-Greek peoples, you know, whom he calls in Turkish he calls them Finwa, which is obviously French. He's just 
just copy paste the the word so transcribes it into uh into the uh into the um uh, Arabic um, sort of alphabet. But what is really interesting, you know, you, you talked about the Rus Rusin, the Ruthenians, right? He was aware of, of, of their distinction from the other Islams. So he has a separate article. So right next to the article on Russia, he has an article on the Rusins or the or the Ruthenians. And he gives like about four different names for them in French and 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 one in uh in, in Turkish. Uh, and he says, you know, th this is basically a Slavic people similar to the Russians. And even he says, like, similar to uh, the inhabitants of lesser Russia, so in other words, of Ukraine. Uh, but 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 for some reason, he doesn't consider the, the Belarusians or the Ukrainians proper to be distinctive enough to merit a separate article like, like the Rusins do. And I think that it's a matter of political geography, because he points out how many of them live in Austria-Hungary. Now, you know, it ha had, say, what is now Belarus ended up like in Prussia, he may have then said, you know, here's this people similar to the Russians living in Germany or whatever, but instead, you know, it is. Yeah, thanks. Um, Pavel? Yeah, thanks. I've got a question for Angela. Uh, so you used that sort of very clever word for people who kind of write in the adopted language, yeah, and become, how, how common is that phenomenon that somebody is sort of, uh, acquire such a mastery in the adopted language, they become a prominent writer or poet. Because I know apart from Bartosik, we had Natalia Arsenio, you know, who was Russian and, you know, adopted Belarus and became a sort of famous poet. Just, you know, how, how common is that in Belarus and outside, that phenomenon? Well, it's a phenomenon with quite a bit of history, actually. And multilingualism in literature is, it has been a thing since antiquity, probably in Europe, it's been recorded since the Middle Ages because, of course, people write in Latin and in the vernacular in many countries. And then again, we can only talk about exophony from the 19th century onwards because that's when <coughs> a national consciousness begins to be to become a more prominent problem in nation building. Then again, <laughs> so for example, it's actually quite common in, I don't want to say bigger language, uh, languages, I'm going to say imperial languages, <laughs> both you and I are native speakers of, of two of them, <laughs> very prominent ones. So Joseph Conrad, who was a Pole, who moved to England and wrote in English, Nabokov wrote in English. Uh, there is a lot of modern exophony in French and German. French, of course, because of the African nations moving to France, being bilingual. And that's why it has to be very carefully defined. Because if someone speaks a heritage language, for example, the Belarusian family who raised a child abroad and they become writer, that's not an exophone, exactly, because they're ethnically Belarusian and they're historically connected to this language. It has to be a foreigner proper. Yeah. It's the so same with like the uh, former empires yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So they have to be removed by at least one generation from the language. In Belarusian itself, it's more common than one would expect. Perhaps I know of, well, it's Mita Bartosi, Barbara Kvapish, who began, began writing in the 70s and actually stopped in the 80s, but we got 10 years there. She was Polish. Uh, no, 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 from what? From what? She didn't move to the uh, Aristotle, in the last talk. Uh, for work, and that's mm -hmm. how she learned at the, the age of 26, 27, she learned the Belarusian language. Then there is Van Shivei, who's from China. He writes short prose, philosophical uh, aphorisms as well. Alexey Artyomov from Russia, who has been on, in Belarus on occasion, but he's from Tula, and has no ethnical ties to Belarus. He writes poetry as well. And um, there's me. <laughs> I write poetry in Belarusian. <laughs> so. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as you pointed out, Angela, uh, in English as one of the major imperial languages of the world, this is a very, very common phenomenon. So if we take a lot of South Asian writers uh, for the last like two or three or more decades, uh, they, in fact, um, the prominent ones tend to write uh, in English rather than uh, sort of vernacular languages of South Asia for multiple reasons. And for some, uh, even if it's even if English isn't their native language, they are the products uh, of an English-speaking educational system in South Asia itself. 
And so you've got um, people like, um, uh, like Salman Rushdie, for example, right, who went to cathedral school in Bombay. Uh, you know, I've got, a, I've got a friend whom I met in the US who went to cathedral school. You emerge from, from cathedral school just like a product of the British Empire, even if it's 70 years after the, the British Empire. And of course, for Rushdie, it was a much more recent uh, sort of thing. You've got Rohin Tan Mystery, for example, who is a, who's a prominent Canadian writer, again, born in Bombay as well, writing in English and so on. And of course, if we look at the Ottoman Empire, then uh, Ottoman Turkish as this kind of imperial language also produced those kinds of writers, such as Shams al-Din Sami, of course, who not only wrote the encyclopedia, but then also, as I pointed out, the first novel uh, in Turkish as well. And, and do you think at what age it becomes a native language? Because, yeah, if you go to school at, sort of at five, but it's still your native language, what do you think is the threshold between, you know, when the language is your native and it's not well, native well, adopted? What, um... If if we are if we are like without getting too pedantic, if we are to um, uh, use the definition of a native language uh, used by the Canadian Census, uh, then that would be the first language that you learned in your childhood and still remember and are still able to speak. So uh, by that definition, it would be the language you learn at home before school, because by definition, it would be the language that. Um, uh, like the language you learn at school, if, if say you're, you're not from an English speaking household, then, the, then if all of your schooling is in English from age five, as you say, that already then would be your second language by this definition and not your native language. But you may acquire late native level proficiency in it. Uh, you'd still, I suppose, count as a second language, right? Yeah. Perhaps, yeah. Perhaps, yeah. Sorry. In linguistics, the consensus is seven years. So whatever you learn after the seven years is called the critical age. Uh, mm -hmm. I have to punctualize here that in the cases of colonized nations like Belarus and Ukraine are most prominently for us and most relevant. Uh, there's another definition of native language, which is the language that is tied historically and ethnically to your nation and you consider to be your native language. That's why the term Rodnaya Mova is so charged in Belarusian, because of course many people will go by the first language that you have learned or the language that you have the best proficiency in. And for many people that would be Russian, mm -hmm. but um, most Belarusians even today will tell you their native language is Belarusian. And that's in line with the post-colonial definition, less linguistic and more mm -hmm. social. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a question to Angela. Um, I have the microphone. <laughs> I really like the way you looked at Bartosik uh, as, as a person, as a man, and as a um, symbolic status, uh, a symbolic figure. And uh, the way you concluded your paper uh, was to talk about uh, people like Bartosik uh, being, on the one hand, writers, on the other hand, cultural figures creators of, of, of cultural trends. How common would you say that is to people writing in, uh, to exophones, to, to people adopting a foreign language as a language of writing? I would say it's absolutely commonplace if the exophone writes in a colonized language, mm -hmm. not as much in a colonial language. Uh, the, uh, as, uh, I'm going to quote Vladimir Nyeklayo, <laughs> actually, <laughs> that, that's pretty funny, because uh, he said when he wrote the introduction to my second poetry collection, and I'm sorry, not very modest, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a very good example. He said, the Spanish language doesn't care. One more poet, one fewer poet, that's fine. Belarusian language has gained a poet, and that's a significant cultural landmark. Mm -hmm. So I would say that many people, not only who write, not only exophones, literary exophones, but also those of us who study Belarusian, Ukrainian, Russian, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we are, whether we want it or not, we're elevated to the state of symbols. It's outside of a personhood and even outside mm -hmm. of our words, per se. Mm -hmm. So we have to deal with that side, new side of our identity mm -hmm. as well. And yeah, it's, it's very common in, in Belarusian and Ukrainian, at least the, the ones I'm most familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, I know from my experience and other people's experience that yes, people, some people will look for validation, some people will look at your opinion at something. 
different point of view. It's rare to have someone from outside of Belarus, right? Help create mm -hmm. Belarusian literature. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say it's natural. Mm -hmm. Whereas English, French, Spanish, German, that they have enough writers from all kinds of different backgrounds mm -hmm. not to, to care as much, if I can put mm -hmm. it that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I, I assume that uh, just a comment to add on top of that um, is that uh, some people might argue that a foreigner cannot uh, be an actual contributor to literature or culture and in a, um, in a one that they were not born into. But um, it, I want to say that in my opinion, there are some things that uh, transcend culture that um, are part of the human experience. So like while, for example, I don't actually know what it means to be Belarusian per se, um, I do know that there are things that I have in common with Belarusians and with Turks and I hope Russians, I hope, um, such as, you know, uh, like emotions, uh, the concept of family, belonging, things like this. Um, these are all topics that um, I believe that anybody can write about. And if it's written in a language that is underrepresented, that it is contributing to the culture, uh, regardless of whether or not it is written from a standpoint of being part of the culture, because everybody is uh, first and foremost human. Any final comments from the speakers? Alex. Okay, that's last question. Robert. Yes, thank you. Um, Could you please introduce uh, Oh, sorry. Um, I'm Alex Budd from the Anglo Belarusian Society. Um, just a, a comment um, in response to. Um, Angela's um, points about exhaustion and Rashid's um, very interesting comparison to the South Asian case. Um, I have some experience of this phenomenon in the case of African literature. Um, and I might take Rashid's point about um, th this rather sort of mechanical um, distinction between when, when you start learning at school and when not. Um, but in the case of African literature, I've noticed that you can actually um, discern discern some of the differences in, in, in a different way that some writers, they kind of self-consciously almost pillarize between their native language and their new language. Um, and to me, it almost creates a kind of almost like a deadness to the writer somehow, even though it is great literature in some respects. Um, a, an example I'd give for that would be Wayasinka, who's a Nobel Prize winning writer, um, but he will not allow any of his Yoruba um, um, language or culture, like he intentionally keeps it separate. Whilst we have people like Chinua Chebi, who is considered to be a lesser writer in many spheres than Soyinka, but he 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 really you can really feel something about the Igbo language in the way he writes English. Um, and it gives it gives something a something to his English, which is not in the Soyinka one where where he, he has that conscious separation. So I wonder if that's another way of maybe defining what what this mm -hmm. what this category might mean. Well, that's a very interesting example you're giving there. I would say it depends less on the writer's conscious understanding of their native, second, acquired heritage languages. It's more of a writing creative method. So I have never considered the question from that angle. And now I, I think I would have to study the writers on a case to case basis. But I think it's more dependent on literature than, than linguistics in this case, but maybe not.